Hey everybody, what's up? It's your girl Bondi Blue and I am back for another The Bondi Blue Show. Episode 22. I'm ring. Okay, so let's just get straight into the topics. Let's not miss words, okay? So, Malaya Obama go to Harvard. She's smart. She is intelligent. She is beautiful. She is wonderful. But because she is the first African American president daughter, she is constantly being picked and prided at even though her father is no longer the president. Just this past week, somebody posted a video of Malaya Obama. Am I saying her name right? Smoking weed as it is legal to do in Massachusetts. Okay, where she is residing while she goes to Harvard. I want to keep mentioning that, okay? Just a couple of months ago, somebody posted a picture of her kissing somebody at a tailgate and everybody was like, ooh. And it's like, what are you expecting from a 19-year-old girl in college? Of course she's going to smoke weed. Of course she's going to drink alcohol. Of course she's going to party and have a good old time. But at the end of the day, she's still the president's daughter at fucking Harvard on her own volition. So as far as I'm concerned, I'm annoyed with people that will not let her be a teenager because she's supposed to be held at some higher standard than the rest of the 19 year olds that are attending Harvard University. Give me a fucking break, okay? And don't think I don't know that it's a one-sided trick pony that's going on here. Always something to say, right wingers. But when it's y'all children acting a fool like Sarah Palin's daughter, then everybody is hushed the fuck, mm-hmm. Leave Malaya Obama alone. Leave her alone, okay? Even Ivanka Trump said y'all need to stop. The Bush girl said y'all need to stop. Chelsea Clinton said y'all need to stop. Let that girl live. Evelyn Braxton, last week I talked to you guys about Tamar Braxton's mom getting on television and talking about the situation with Vincent. Well, she was actually, it was a YouTube video that was from a radio show interview. I'm sorry. This week, she went on television to the sister circle, okay? Shout out to Selena Johnson and the other ladies, okay? What happened to you being on there, Quentin? What's up? Anyway, I'm not shading. I'm just asking. He was there and then he wasn't there no more. What's going on, Funky? Uh, yeah. So she went on the sister circle and she starts to tell us of an incident in which Vincent Herbert was being physically abusive to her daughter Tamar, okay? And I've been on Evelyn Braxton's side this whole time, okay? With the shift of the wig, she reminds me of my mother. But here we are today with the third interview about this abuse situation with Tamar and Vince. I don't understand why she's doing more interviews at this point, which now makes me side eye her. Definitely. Okay. But when she did the interview, she talked about Vincent and Tamar having some type of fight that sounded like the elevator in their home was dropping to the ground and crashing. And she ran in to see what was going on and he was beating her. And she's like, no, Vincent, that's not how we do things. And he turned around and the look in his eyes scared her. So she ran back to her room and grabbed that baby and held him so tight and she put a chair under the door and barricaded herself in there to protect her and the baby because she did not know what he was going to do. And I'm just like, girl, look, okay, Evelyn Braxton, let me tell you why I'm giving you the girl look, okay? Because how are you as her mother going to just lock yourself in a room with her baby while she's being abused and just... Pray that it just hurry up and goes away. How does that take place as a mother? I'm just saying. I'm not trying to shade the Braxton's mama, but I know that my mama, Tanya, okay, Tanya would have went in her room and got her gun out of her purse and then came back and seen what was really popping with Vincent. But you know what? My mama different. We from the South. We believe in guns, okay? So maybe we, you know, live our lives differently. But I don't understand how at this point Evelyn didn't call the police. If you were scared that he was going to physically attack you because you got involved, then you should have called the police on his ass. I'm a firm believer and if we can keep the police out of the situation, please let's do that. Okay? I'm a firm believer in that and, and there's another situation in which we're going to talk about it and y'all might say I'm being hypocritical. Whatever you want to call it, guess what? I don't give a fuck because this is how I feel. 
You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel like physically a man in most situations can kill a woman hitting her. Women not all the time can kill a man by hitting him. So the danger factor is higher in a situation where Evelyn is running into the back barricade in the door. That say the next story that we're going to get into, which is Naya Rivera, okay? Now, Evelyn Braxton, before I move into Naya Rivera, I just want to say something to you, mother, okay? Because I know I don't have a right to say nothing to you because I ain't got no children, okay? But what I am going to say to you is stop speaking on Tamar's behalf. If she wants to say something or give some specifics on the abuse that she endured by Vincent Herbert, you let her ass get out there with her Muppet baby face and give an interview. You need to check yourself, okay? I know you might feel like you're defending your daughter, but you should have been defending your daughter when Vincent Herbert was beating her ass and you was locking yourself in the room. Okay, moving on to Naya Rivera. Now, y'all know Naya Rivera, okay? Big Sean wrote that song, I ain't fucking with you. You little, you little, you little dumb ass bitch, I ain't fucking with you. There's a million fucking things that I'd rather fucking do than I'll be fucking with you. I don't give a fuck. I don't, I don't, I don't give a fuck about you or anything that you do. Obviously, you do, Big Sean, because. I saw your pettiness on Twitter <laughs> as it pertains to Naya Rivera getting arrested. And please believe that when I saw she got arrested for domestic violence, you was the first person I thought of when you, you know, when I thought about how you used to say she was crazy. And that bitch was crazy. You wrote a whole song about how the bitch was crazy. And everybody thought it was a joke. But then she came out and said she don't take a bath every day. And we was looking at her like, bitch, don't make it seem like that's some black people shit. We don't know what you doing over there, but that's not some black people shit. We bathe, okay? As much as we possibly can, black people is bathing. Talking about, that's a Caucasian thing to take a shower every day. Bitch, well, her husband, who she's only been married to for like, what, a couple of years? If that, it hasn't even been that long that they've been married. Uh, but she got for him like three months after she broke up with Big Sean, okay? Her husband's name is Ryan Dorsey. Apparently, they were walking down the street, chilling with their kid, and they got into some type of argument, and she punched him in the mouth and in the face. He proceeded to call the cops on her ass. I feel like Naya Rivera is crazy as hell, and I do not feel sorry for her, and she probably should be on some type of medication. But I don't think that he should have called the police on her, because if you was going to go back to the house with her and wait for the police to come, then your ass wasn't really in any real danger. Okay, now if she hit you more than once, this is like a habitual thing, then call the police on the ass to make an example out of her bitch ass. So if this was happening all the time, go ahead, Ryan, I don't care. But just the woman in me was just like, damn, why you had to call the police on the fight? You know what I'm saying? Is it just me? Is it just me that feel this way? I know y'all gonna say I'm being a hypocrite because I don't think that... You know, Naya Rivera should have got the cops called on her necessarily as much as I think Vincent should have got the cops called on his big ass. But, you know, I think size matters in some situations. I really do. But, you know, I digress. I'm going to just go ahead and let y'all say how y'all feel about it down below in the comments. Centoya Brown has gone viral just this past week. Celebrities tweeting in her defense. Okay, coming to her backing like a meek meal get together. She's been in jail for 13 years, okay? Ever since she was 16 years old. She was child trafficked from what I understand. And she shot her John in the back of the head because she believed he was reaching for a gun. And she was sentenced to life in prison with 51 years before probation. I want to know what insensitive, racist fucking judge was looking at that black little girl like she's a murderous little bitch. We're never going to let her out again. Even though she was 16 years old and with a John who was 40 something years old. If you don't understand the mental <laughs> instability that that little girl must have had in order to go through John after John after John and at some point felt fear for her life because her life had been put in danger numerous times and nobody came to save her. And when she finally decides to save herself in the way that she knew how at that moment, you decide that it is just to put her in jail for life? Are you fucking kidding me? What kind of twisted ass 
justice system are we looking at here? This is going to be the one thing that is going to make me like uh, Kim Kardashian. Because I told y'all, I don't fuck with people that don't have real talent and get famous over doing nothing. This was a situation that I was like, all right, Kim. All right, Kim, girl. You making me look at you different, girl. You might be growing up and I might be growing up too, girl. We might be growing up together. But she decided that she was going to have her lawyers to look into this to see if there was anything that her good money could do to help this little girl in this situation. Not little girl, because she's 29 years old and I'm sure very grown and was grown at 16. But just to see her feel moved enough to help made me feel some type of way. Now, the thing that really made Centoya Brown's story pop again was PBS did a documentary about her in 2011 and a recent viewing of that documentary has sparked all of this all of this celebrity newfound interest snoop dogg you know rihanna kim all of them have been saying that something needs to be done about this and i really hope that their celebrity and whatever money kim kardashian wants to put behind you know the lawyers helps i really do and i really feel like we need to get inside our justice system about this shit moving on so spike lee gave me my motherfucking life on Thanksgiving when he dropped the series She's Gotta Have It based off the 1986-87 film She's Gotta Have It that Spike Lee put out back in the day. It was in black and white. It was about Nola Darling, a young African-American beautiful woman who was dating three different men at one time. It was a really great movie, okay? And I hadn't seen the movie in years, so I rewatched it right before the show came out just so I could have a good idea of what the differences were. The differences between the show and the movie obviously show in movies, so you have to make the show long form. So, Dewanda Wise, the gorgeous, beautiful Dewanda Wise, played the new Nola Darling. Who is, I'm sorry, let me get this right, a sex positive polyamorous pansexual artist who is dating three men, Greer, Mars, and the married Jamie, and a woman, an older woman who's a single mom named Opal. Okay, and it's the same characters. Main difference, that lesbian relationship that's taking place in 2017 was not about to take place at the end of the 80s. So Opal in the original movie was somebody who was a lesbian that wanted to be with Nola, but Nola was always rebuffing. So, you know, that was a huge change because in the show, Nola's relationship with Opal was actually almost more significant than her relationships with the men who were, you know, like the basic main story uh, of the whole she's got to have it premise, which is Nola Darling, Greer, Mars, and Jane. Okay. Now, Mars was originally played by Spike Lee himself. The character was totally repurposed and is a fun, goofy young guy, but very sweet, very genuine, half Puerto Rican, half black. Then there's Greer, who is obviously full of himself. And the first movie was played by Flash, Ebony Fox. Yeah! <laughs> Shout out to Robert Townsend. Those two characters are a lot alike, but I think in the show, the character was more likable because we had to spend more time with him. You would not want to have spent as much time as we spent for 10 episodes with Greer from the first movie as you did with the show. You just not would have wanted to. He was a total asshole, okay? And Jamie, Jamie has always been the constant. Jamie has always been the one that seemed most in love with her. Now, his main difference is in the show, he's married. When he was on the movie, he was not married, okay? Now, in the show, he's married to a light-skinned woman who is having a lifelong identity crisis, okay? They're raising their very black but mixed-looking son going to a very prestigious white school who decided to make a YouTube video as a class assignment to go viral with his white and Asian friends in blackface and him in whiteface with nigger all over their shirts. It was a scene. Okay, the show touches on so many different issues in our community. Gentrification, the gentrification of Brooklyn, that shit is going on right here in New Orleans. It's crazy why I see white people now that I never saw them before. Okay, um, it also touches on uh, the ass shot epidemic, <laughs> as I like to call it. Shemeca, one of our close friends, works at a burlesque, uh, a burlesque type of strip 
bar situation because it's not really a stripping joint it's more like a burlesque show but they put that that mindset on her of wanting a bigger ass so that she can dance and make more money than being a table server right so that's one of the things she gets the ass shots and it was very painful and deep and profound to watch just what some of these young girls will go through to have a certain look for what okay for what i was not here for i'm not here for that anyway but lord that was so hard to watch i watched the show twice like you know the whole 10 episodes twice and i could not sit through it the second time <laughs> okay fat joe is the owner of the, the uh, strip club that she works at by the way and he's hilarious Clorinda is her bougie homegirl who is a curator and works at a art gallery and she presents Nola's art. She's very behind her friend but she's low-key hating on her friend because Nola started dating Mars who they had just broken up. Clorinda and Mars had just broken up and Nola wanted to date him. She asked, Clorinda said she didn't care. They start to date and now every time they're in the same room Clorinda is pissed the fuck off. The main thing that takes place which makes it so different is that Nola was sexually assaulted. Not really sexually assaulted, but she was walking down the street coming from Clorinda's spot and she was grabbed up by some crazy ass dude on the street. So she comes up with this street art with all of these posters and different pictures of women and herself saying hashtag my name, my name is not, okay? So my name is not a yo ma. My name is not Say Red, as they say down here. <laughs> My name is not Hey Black Motherfucking Bitch, as she was called by the guy who pulled herself away from him and ran away because she was so scared. So it was a street art that was taken over and a lot of people loved it and Mars was really supportive of it. And then it got defaced and she felt like she had been abused all over again she felt like she had been assaulted all over again so then she starts going to therapy when she realizes actually taking a toll on her psyche her therapist was heather headley and can i say y'all heather headley is like if god was gonna be a black woman heather headley is god <laughs> okay just the way she would talk her mannerisms everything and then it was so funny, the music in the show, like right before we went to Heather Headley, they, they played a Heather Headley song. Like I want to watch it again just to watch the scenes with Heather Headley, okay? And please don't forget about Miss Rockaletta Moss, okay? One of the jobs that Nola holds down as a starving artist is she's a teacher, art teacher at an uh, at-risk school. And Miss Rockaletta Moss is the principal of the school. And Miss Rockaletta Moss has a very deep, profound fucked up story that mirrors the stories of some of the students that Nola teaches which is that they've been sexually abused assaulted or in Miss Rockaletta Moss situation pimped out by her mother her crackhead mother so Miss Rockaletta Moss okay gives you one of the best monologues of the entire show that was another thing monologues were brought back with this show monologues are something that they don't do in film and television anymore like talking about it because people's you know attention spans are so short they don't want to see somebody speaking to them passionately for more than 20 seconds but that is what they brought back in this show and it was fucking fabulous you guys it was amazing kevin and aniko hard finally 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 had they fucking baby <laughs> Y'all, I feel like Aniko been pregnant for so damn long. I think she was like two weeks overdue in her pregnancy. Either way, congratulations to them for bringing in a beautiful baby into this world. Amongst all of this bullshit, Kevin Hart is still shining. And they will have a healthy, loving family, I'm sure. And I really hope that Aniko and Tori put their bullshit aside. Because y'all got more children not between y'all that are part of this family that have come out of Lil' Kev's dick. <laughs> Shout out to Kevin Hart. And lastly, another pregnancy, Eva Marcel is pregnant with a boy, um, with her boyfriend, Michael Sterling, who was a recent Atlanta mayoral candidate. And Kevin McCall, her ex-baby daddy, who we tried so hard to have patience with, but he's fucking crazy, decided to tweet or Instagram some incoherent message in which he tries to tell her new man to meet him somewhere to fight. And this is some bullshit. He posted a picture of Michael with 
uh, his daughter. And he must have felt some type of way about that. And I'm like, you need to get the fuck over that. Because now y'all are both about to have children for Eva. So you need to get past this. That man is going to be in your child's life. And you need to grow the fuck up and get back on your medication, Kevin McCall. Because you always coming out of pocket with the crazy shit. Okay? Get back on your medication. It's time for my motherfucking advice. It's time for my motherfucking advice. Yes, Jesus. All with your bread, bitch. All with your bread. <laughs> okay, y'all. Let's get into the MF and advice this week. I am 21 and I have been single and dating people for about three years now. I just recently reconnected with this dude from high school. We vibe pretty well. I wouldn't say that I feel butterflies with him, but I definitely feel comfortable with him. He's sweet, relatively chivalrous, and well-meaning enough. He has been, we have been seeing each other for a couple of weeks and he really likes me. He consistently tells me how he wants me to be his girl and blah, blah, blah. There's only one big problem, the sex. Mm. The sex is mediocre as fuck, girl. Now, I ain't been around the block too many times and I think of sex almost on a bell curve, right? You got your great experiences, your meh experiences, and then the ones that you don't even want to bother talking about. When we have sex, he always gets off. I make this nigga come five or six times in a night, but he doesn't make me come once. What man can come five or six times in one? <laughs> I ain't met a nigga yet that can pop up that easy, okay? I ain't been around the block too many times either. I can count them all on one hand, but goddamn, bitch. <laughs> what you got going on over there? What pills are y'all taking? I've chatted with him about it on multiple occasions. He said whatever I need him to do, he'll do it. Not only does he barely know his way around the pussy after having to let him know how unsatisfied I was for the third or fourth time, he tried putting his face in the place, as Roxanne would say. Shout out to Rox. He was down there for five minutes tops and hit me with the my jaw hurts. When I tell you I wanted to punch him dead in his face, I have been with women. I've only been in actual relationships with women and never, not ever have I experienced jaw pain. And I'd eat the pussy for hours. If your jaw is hurting so bad, then you need to stop after five minutes. You're doing it wrong, stupid. Ugh. <laughs> Damn, he can't say you don't know what you're talking about when you didn't eat box before too. I have similar situations taking place. It's not just the fact that he isn't making me come. It feels like he doesn't want to make me come, which only makes me angrier. I hear this isn't too uncommon in heterosexual relationships, but I don't know what else to do. Do I leave him be or keep it moving? Find someone whose goal is to satisfy me or do I settle for a seemingly great and sweet guy with some mediocre ass sex? P.S. It's not his dick. He has a nice sized dick. He's just obviously not the sharpest tool in the shed. I really need your advice. Dump him. <laughs> Let me tell you something, okay? First of all, whenever two people are about to engage in sexual relations for the first time, there's a learning curve. So whether it's female or male, there are things that have to get worked out. The kinks have to get worked out. We're all different. We've had different partners. We don't always know what makes the other person tick all the time. It's something that takes time to get into a groove and get it right. If you have tried to get into a groove and get it right and you feel that he is not trying and does not want to try to get into the groove and make it right, then you need to dump his ass. It does not matter how well-meaning, how nice. If the sex is shitty, you're going to cheat on him. You're 21 years old. This is the time to get the best dick of your life. The best vagina of your life. Whichever you prefer, it is time to get the best of it that you're going to get. Okay? You don't settle for mediocre dick at 21. You just don't. Okay? You just don't. Alright? Especially if he can't get on a good foot. Okay? I'm just saying, if you can't get on a good foot, girl, you got to go ahead and let that go. 
I don't even have any other advice I would give you. I would never tell a woman to stay with somebody at 21 years old who she's sexually incompatible with. I don't care how nice they are. Tell him to go fuck some other females and, and, and learn some shit, then come back. Okay? Okay? All right? I don't know. I don't know. But you just know that most of the time when dudes have fucked a lot, they're really good at it. Okay? I need you to at least have 11 bitches under your belt. <laughs> I'm just playing. <laughs> But I am going to say this. You are way too young to be trying to settle down with some amateuric, mediocre dick, girl. Move on. Keep him as a friend. You're cute, but we can't be together. <laughs> I love you to make fun of it, but goddamn, that shit hella personal. And uh, yeah, I just got to tell you the real. In the real list, ain't nobody got time for that. You can only teach somebody so much. You 21, okay? You don't need to be teaching nobody nothing. They should be teaching you, okay? Look, that's my advice. Please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. Shake them tits, shake them tits, shake them tits. <laughs> Care Bear Share. Shake them tits, shake them tits, shake them tits. Okay? Y'all, I'm so tired. But I love y'all. I appreciate y'all. I rock with y'all. And I'll see y'all in Real Housewives of Atlanta.